We've been taking a fairly intense look at Pentecostalism, which I think is really appropriate in light of the huge growth and worldwide impact of Pentecostalism. We've looked a little bit at its origins. We've looked at one of its uh, more influential and flamboyant representatives. And uh, today I want to look a little more uh, systematically at uh, Pentecostalism, um, bearing in mind that this is a huge movement. Uh, for example, in 1984 alone, the Assemblies of God, the largest Pentecostal denomination in America, planted 2,000 churches. That's a lot of churches. Now, sometimes you have to be a little careful with Pentecostal numbers because they're not being audited, and we don't know how many of these churches survived and flourished, but if they planted half that many, it's a huge number of churches to plant uh, in one year. Uh, Pentecostalism, as we look at it historically, we can say uh, has passed probably through at least three stages or has seen three waves. Uh, original Pentecostalism, as we talked about it in the last lecture, uh, was a movement very much oriented to the idea that they wanted to recapture what the early church had had in terms of the presence of the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit, uh, particularly in healings and in speaking in tongues. Uh, and that led to the creation of a number of Pentecostal denominations uh, because uh, their new insights were not welcomed into most of the rest of Protestantism. Uh, early in the formation of those new denominations, they began to face a very serious problem internally that some of the early Pentecostals began to reject the doctrine of the Trinity uh, in the name of what came to be known as the oneness doctrine, a form of modalism that says um, there is no real distinction of persons in the Godhead. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just names, different names for the one God. And uh, Jesus is the one God come in the flesh. This was very traumatic for the early Pentecostals because they had to, most of the Trinitarian Pentecostals labeled these modalists as heretics, but these heretics were all speaking in tongues and performing miracles. And so how was it possible that the Holy Spirit could be present with the heretics? How could the very signs that they claimed marked them as uh, children of God be present in heretics? <clears throat> and the answer to that was that uh, these were demonic counterfeits. Uh, so nonetheless, it kind of blurred the witness a little bit as to the clarity of what was going on. So that's the first wave, the, the original impulse, uh, the end, often time tied to end time speculation. The second wave, arising mainly in the 60s, is often labeled as the charismatic wave. These were kinder, gentler Pentecostals. Uh, these were Pentecostals who said um, uh, the baptism in the Holy Ghost is available to everybody, but maybe it's not actually for everybody. Certainly we don't want to pressure anybody into this. We find it personally very helpful, but you may not, and that's fine. Uh, and these folks, uh, many of them operated within established denominations and uh, were not necessarily uh, driven out. And even within the Roman Catholic Church, there arose charismatic Roman Catholics who claimed to have had these experiences and came to be uh, tolerated uh, within the mainline movements. The, the old Pentecostals were rather suspicious of these charismatics. They thought they were rather accommodating and rather compromising. Uh, but nonetheless, there was a profound impact in the 60s and beyond by these charismatics. And then maybe about the 80s or so, uh, there came a, a third wave of uh, a renewed kind of uh, more old line uh, Pentecostal, but focusing on different gifts. And uh, in this new movement was particularly an emphasis on wealth. Not only health, but also wealth was promised by the Holy Spirit. The prosperity gospel begins to attract more attention. Uh, word of knowledge, word of prophecy becomes more significant in some of these movements. So um, the basic theology remains the same of the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, but uh, now there's more talk about the restoration of the office of the prophet, and even in some groups, the restoration of the office of the apostle. And uh, so it becomes somewhat more radical even, and I think certainly more worldly. Uh, the original Pentecostals, whatever their faults, were 
very dedicated uh, to uh, their cause and, and very self-sacrificing in a lot of ways. A uh, few of them had private jets to fly themselves around on. And um, it, it's interesting for all of the Pentecostal insistence, especially in the third wave, that all of the gifts of the uh, New Testament are restored and so we should have apostles. The one apostolic practice they don't seem to follow is to share all possessions in common. Uh, that doesn't seem to have been restored uh, in the uh, latter days. So uh, in any case, there is this new aggressiveness and of course many have uh, seen these folks on uh, um, television. They've made very effective use of television and of radio and it takes a huge amount of money to take advantage of television. Uh, you have to have a huge amount of money constantly coming in to do uh, television well, and uh, it helps to have a prosperity gospel that you can promise to make people rich by sending you money. So uh, this is something of the history and the development of the movement, but even more important to us, I think, is the question, why is Pentecostalism attractive? What draws people to Pentecostalism? Uh, because if we're going to um, think about the movement, if we're going to relate to Pentecostals, if we're going to talk to Pentecostals about differences between Reformed Christianity and their understanding of Christianity, uh, we have to know a little bit more, I think, about where they're coming from. And uh, I'm sorry, but I have five points. Um, uh, uh, the first is, and I think we have to take this very seriously, the first is... Um, they really believe they are being biblical. And I don't think we can um, just dismiss that out of hand. We have to take that uh, seriously. And uh, we have to be able to respond to that. They read the New Testament and they say, Christians in the New Testament spoke in tongues, so do we. Christians in the New Testament saw miraculous healing, so do we. Um, why shouldn't these things still be present? As I said yesterday, Amy loved to say, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he was a healer yesterday, he's a healer today. Uh, Jesus is not the great I was. He's the great I am. And uh, what, what, what do we say about that? We'll come back to uh, talk about that. But I, I think we mustn't underestimate their appeal to the Scripture on these points. Uh, secondly, um, their message is clear and simple when they preach. Uh, that's not always true of Reformed preaching. Uh, when, when you hear them, you know exactly what they're trying to tell you. Uh, it's a very simple message often. And um, often it's done in a rather entertaining way, one way or another. Uh, but that notion of simplicity and clarity of communication is important to keep in mind as well. That's why... Pentecostalism has succeeded particularly in areas where there are relatively uneducated people. And uh, they've been able to connect with those people. Thirdly, Pentecostals ask the question, how do you know God is present with you? How do you know God is in your midst? How do you know God is present to bless your form of Christianity? Now, that's a good question to ask of almost any Christian group. But if you ask a Roman Catholic who's well-informed about that, they'll say, I know God is present. He's present in the altar. Uh, Christ is physically present. After the priest has said the words of consecration, it looks like bread, but it's not bread. It's Christ. I know exactly where God is in the service. A Pentecostal similarly knows God is present in felt, observable, powerful expressions. When someone speaks in tongues, you know God is present. When you see someone healed, you know God is present. When someone stands up with a word of prophecy, you know God is present. And again, I don't think we should underestimate the significance of that as validating that experience. Uh, a number of years ago now, I, I ran across, almost accidentally, a book with an unpromising title. It was entitled, uh, Prophecies and Miracles in 19th Century France. Now, if you'd seen that, wouldn't you have picked it up? Uh, by a Thomas Kesselman in 1983. And he talks about all of the claims 
of miracles taking place in Roman Catholic circles in France in the 19th century. Of course, that was the great age when uh, Mary appeared at Lourdes. And uh, ever since then, uh, hundreds of thousands of people annually have traveled to Lourdes to seek healing uh, from the Virgin Mary. And the place is full of um, crutches left behind of people who've been healed at Lourdes. And Kesselman raised the question in this book, why did this become so attractive to people in 19th century France? And he said, the traditional interpretation has been this is just a leftover of, of medieval religion. Uh, but he argues, I think rather convincingly, that in point of fact, this is a very modern response to the attacks on Christianity that were taking place in the intellectual community of 19th century France. And it wasn't just a superstitious leftover, but it was an act of faith that was able to say, well, you skeptics say our religion doesn't count. You skeptics say atheism is the truth, but look at what's happening. God is powerfully present among us. We know you're wrong because we've seen the power of God in action. And I think that's exactly some of the appeal of Pentecostalism in America initially and then around the world, uh, that it is a powerful apologetic ar uh, answer, if you will, uh, to the um, claims that Christianity is false and that atheism is true. And so people are drawn to this palpable notion of the presence of God that you can feel and that you can see. Now, this raises an interesting question for us as Reformed people. Where is God when we worship? Well, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, number four, in terms of um, the appeal of Pentecostalism, as a worshiping community, it's an active community. Now, see, we're having a Reformed experience here. You're all sitting perfectly quietly, and I'm talking. That's a Reformed experience. You're not allowed to clear your throat. You're not allowed even a Reformed grunt. Uh, you're not allowed to applaud. Uh, you're sitting quietly. In a Pentecostal church, per particularly a traditional Pentecostal church, there is an active participation of everybody in the service. You're allowed to amen. You're allowed to raise your hands and wave them. Uh, you're allowed to stand up. Depending on the varieties of Pentecostalism, uh, you're allowed in some to be slain in the spirit. Uh, you're allowed to dance in the spirit in the aisles. Uh, you're certainly allowed to encourage the minister actively with preach it, brother, and amen. And um, uh, you're, you're allowed to speak in tongues in the middle of the service in some services. So th there's this sense of participation. Uh, and that appeals to a lot of modern people. They don't want to sit quietly and just look and listen. Uh, they want to be involved. They want to feel they're making their contribution. Um, and so that active community is a significant part of what uh, makes Pentecostalism attractive to many people. And then Pentecostalism, fifthly, has been able to be culturally relevant. It's been able to connect on a cultural level. Now, what, what is the most cultural aspect of any worship service? It's probably the music. Uh, music reflects and carries a sense of, of culture, and the more contemporary the music, the more it can sense to, seem to be in tune with the times in which we're living. And so, uh, as we saw yesterday, Amy Semple McPherson very early on introduced a band into the life of the church. And... Um, uh, the instruments a church has can very much set the mood, the tone, the cultural character of what's going on. And these Pentecostals were able to make people feel uh, the church is really with it. The church feels not like a 16th century experience or a 12th century experience. The church feels like today. And... Um, Again, I don't think we can underestimate the, the power of that, the use of drama, and, of course, the use of promises of health and wealth. What are most people interested in life? Being well and having money enough to live on. 
if you can promise that, um, you're off to the races. Uh, you're uh, making a good beginning. So how do we respond to that? We have to take those attractions seriously. We can't be dismissive of it. But how do we respond? Well, in terms of uh, culturally relevant, we can say, don't we have to distinguish being culturally relevant from being culturally accommodating? If you walk in to a room with your eyes closed and you don't know whether you're in a bar or in a church, maybe there's been too much accommodation. Uh, maybe there hasn't been enough separation. Uh, maybe something is being lost. After all, one of the New Testament requirements, as we read in Hebrews 12, of worship is that it be reverent. Now, the word reverent isn't immediately obvious in its meaning any more than the word modesty is immediately obvious in its meaning. As the Supreme Court once said about pornography, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. Uh, there was a time when women had bobbed hair. It was immodest. A lot of you women are in a lot of trouble. When Amy Semple McPherson bobbed her hair in the 30s, I think, it was a scandal. She gave up the Pentecostal bun and had bobbed hair. Um, there was a time when women <clears throat> wouldn't have worn pants in public, right? It was immodest. Why exactly covering legs was uh, immodest and revealing them was modest? We, we won't go into, you know, but, but you see, modesty is somewhat culturally defined. Reverence can be somewhat culturally defined. We have to be careful about that. Nevertheless, for the church to sound like the bar probably isn't reverent. And uh, that's at least something we ought to talk about. We also need to stress that the Bible, while making wonderful promises, constantly reminds us that the call to follow Christ is a call to suffer, is a call to weakness. Uh, the the, the uh, disciple is not greater than the master. And uh, we have to ask, are these promises of health and wealth really coinciding with the spirit of the New Testament? They could... They can lift half a verse out of places and say, see, the Lord's promised you well. But I think in context, uh, those verses don't work very well, and we have to challenge them about that. What about the active community dimension <clears throat> of Pentecostalism? I think we have to think about that sense of community. Is there a real community in Pentecostal churches? Now, I think there probably isn't some. Um, but the active community really is a community of emotion, not a community of caring, necessarily. What, what kind of community does Christ intend to create in the congregations of his people? Uh, they're intended to be communities of learning, communities of faith, communities of love where people know one another and care for one another. And there to be communities of discipline uh, where there is authority. And if uh, people are living contrary to the way of Christ, there are elders who speak to them, correct them, call them back to the way of faithfulness. And in a community of emotion, those things don't necessarily happen. Now, I'm not trying to argue they never happen in Pentecostal churches, but it's something to think about. Uh, I remember hearing a Pentecostal preacher from L.A. say, uh, some people said to me we ought to have a directory in this church. It would help people get to know one another. It's a great idea, but there's so much coming and going, we could never keep a directory up to date. Well, that's problematic. That should be a sign of, uh, of some concern. We need real communities of faith and love and uh, discipline if we're being faithful. What about the presence of God? Well, this brings us back to... Uh, the question, where is God in a reform service? I suspect a lot of reform, reform people think, you know, our service is sort of like a schoolroom, and the, the minister up there is the teacher, and God's kind of like the principal. Uh, he walks by occasionally, looks in to see if learning is happening, and walks on. In other words, I think we don't often have a sense that God is really with us, that God is really present. And uh, for Reformed people, God is present in his word. We have to have that sense. Uh, this is a living book, the book tells us. And it's living because God speaks still through this word and in this word. And, and that's where our excitement has come. Not too much excitement, 
but where we have to have a little excitement about the word and its presence. We have to work at trying to be simpler and clearer, um, often, especially when we are initially contacting people. But above all, we have to be confident that our theology of the work of the Holy Spirit is a biblical th theology, and we have to be able to show that. And um, there are some key verses we have to keep in mind. Um, Paul, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 11 and following, says, I've been a fool, you forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. What are, what are miracles in the life of the early church? Paul says right here, they're signs of apostles. Uh, they're not for all times in the church by implication. Because in Ephesians 2 verse 20, we read that the work of the apostles is foundational to the church. It's not continuing in the church. And so if apostles are foundations, that foundation, once it's laid, doesn't need the signs to continue to accompany it. Now listen, uh, th this is a verse not off, or verses not often quoted, but I think are very important um, uh, to this discussion. Uh, listen to these verses from Hebrews chapter 2, verses uh, 3 and 4, where the author to Hebrews says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He's been talking about the great salvation. How will we escape if we uh, neglect it? It was declared at first by the Lord, Jesus, that is, and it was attested to us, so we've got about three generations here, by those who heard him, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. You see, Hebrews here is saying, Jesus came and God the Father bore witness to the truthfulness of what he was saying and what his apostles were saying by signs and wonders and miracles. And the whole thing is sort of cast in the past tense. As if already by the time of Hebrews, this is not so much a present expectation, but a looking back. And, of course, that's sort of true of the Old Testament as well. There were many miracles in the days of Moses, but relatively few miracles through the history of Israel. And uh, so I don't think we have to be um, embarrassed to search the Scriptures and to find in the Scriptures not only this testimony to the foundational character of miracles at the beginning of the church, but also the clear witness of the New Testament that all Christians have the Holy Spirit. It's not a second blessing to have the Holy Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, I think, makes that very clear. And so uh, Pentecostalism is a huge presence among us. Uh, it's, for the foreseeable future, going to be a huge uh, influence around the world. It's hard to evaluate because we don't always know what theology they're preaching, how much truth is actually present among them. But I think we can have confidence that the fundamental approach of Pentecostals for all of their zeal really is not biblical in their claims of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we should uh, have confidence um, that our Reformed Fathers have understood the Holy Spirit better. Thank you.